and we did with a work of antimony. And we explained it. But but with God, nothing shall be impossible. We can see now it is God hmm. that is work at work in us to will and to do. So further, there is no true invocation or calling of God without faith. Or any calling that is acceptable to God or that will be of any spiritual benefit to a person without any faith. So, if you are calling on God without faith, genuine faith, God does not accept it. We encourage, we entreat people to pray. The Bible says that we must pray without cease, ceasing. Pray always. But you must, there's, a, there's a method of prayer. With all supplication, you must pray with fervency. You must pray genuinely from a heart of love, a heart of obedience, a heart of repentance. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But that calling must be from a heart that is genuinely touched, that is genuinely obedient to God's will. Genuine faith. Call it on the name of the Lord as it is practiced in our religious worship, must be done in faith. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? That's the first point. The first point is, you cannot call on someone in whom you do not believe. It is an impossibility. Because, as we, as we read in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. Because the first step is that you must believe that he is. If you do not believe that God is, how are you going to call upon him? And then you must also realize he's a rewarder of those that didn't just seek him. So now, when we look at the second clause of Romans 10, 40, it said, And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? How can you call on someone in whom you have not believed? And how can you believe in or on someone you have not heard. Or who then can be saved? That's the question, Pastor Peter. If to be saved demands that you call upon God, or call upon Jesus for salvation, and the question is, or the, the conundrum is, or the difficulty is, how can you call if you have not heard. And how can you hear. If there is no one to tell you. So how, how can a man be saved. Who can be saved. That's a question. Let's look at Matthew 19 and 26. Uh, actually let's read from verse 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples. Assuredly I say to you. That it is hard. It is impossible. But he says it is hard. For a rich man. To enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible to them that believe. Hallelujah. Amen. So now, how can you believe on someone you have not heard? And how shall you call on him and who you have not believed? Who then can be saved? That's the question. With me, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen. With men, there is a conundrum. With men, there is a difficulty. With men, there is a possibility. But with God, all things are possible to them that believe when it pertains to salvation. When it pertains to God's gracious gift for salvation. All things are possible to God. But what? To them that believe. Now, that same scripture 
is dealt with in Luke chapter 18. We're going to read Luke 18, 9 to 14, and 24 to 26. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves. You see that now? That they were righteous and despised others. He spoke a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes towards to heaven, but beat his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went home or went down to his house justified, rather than the other one. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Who then can be saved? With God, all things are possible. But you see now, we said that anyone that genuinely call upon God or uh, uh, invocate uh, 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 in prayer, generally by faith, will be saved. But the Pharisee, he was self-righteous. He considered himself righteous. He considered himself pure. But that was in his own sight. He said that I am not like a tax collector. I am not an extortionist. I am not unjust. I am not an adulterer. I am not, not like any other man. I am not like other men. I am pure. I am holy and righteous. That is his prayer. But it was not from a heart of genuinely seeking God. It was not a heart that was broken and contrite. Self-righteousness. I give tithe of all that I possess. I pray after I fast twice a week. See? How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? When you believe in God, by faith, you will see yourself as lacking. You will see yourself as falling short. You will, say, you will see yourself as a sinner in need of his grace, in need of his mercy. Because it will come from a, a heart that has been changed, that has been washed, a heart that has been cleansed, a mind that has been delivered from self-righteousness. Renewed and quickened. And then you will call from a genuine heart like the, like this, like the sinner. He says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Mm -hmm. God, be merciful to, to me, a sinner. He beat upon his chest. You can, you can believe in God without seeing. Because we don't see Jesus now. The pastor is, but we see him in the spirit. Is that a conundrum? It is a, it is a conundrum for man's perspective, not from God. <laughs> see, again... With God, all things are possible That's to right. them that believe. That's right. With God, nothing is impossible. So, so there's no conundrum with God. At all. He can, he's, a, he's our knowing, he's our wise God. The only wise God of our Savior. He knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. That's right. He knows what is possible and what is not possible. He knows what even, he, he even knows hypothetical. You know we use hypothetical sometimes? If, yeah. if, this is, if, if this had been done, this would have not occurred. That's right. God knows all answers to everything. So he cannot be confused. He's not, he does not, he's not taken by unawares. To us it's a conundrum. Again, it is a power with difficulty, but when evidences are clearly presented and you consider the evidences, you will see that there's no difficulty. Because that is what we are proving to you, that with God, all things are possible. That's why he said, how can you call on whom you have not believed? And how can you believe in someone that you have not heard? 
And how can you hear without a preacher? And how can you preach without a message? That is the man that is an impossibility. So Paul is laying out that it is possible by faith. It is possible by the Spirit of God. See, with God, he has laid out a strategy and a methodology to bring about the plan of salvation, to make it work. He has worked through all things that pertain unto life and godliness from all eternity past. Hallelujah. See, God has just put it into a place what he has, Jesus, what he has decreed before. So we're going to see now how this works. A person may not have faith in Christ without hearing about him. You can have faith because Bible says faith comes by hearing. But, but we can see something now. Initial faith always comes from the Holy Spirit without the word. You see, you see God must implant faith and then the word can work. Look at, look at a, a, an example. You want to plant some seed in the ground. And you go, you take the seed. And the ground has not been prepared beforehand. It is, it is compacted from, from walking or, tra or traffic flowing over it. It is hard and dry. Chances are, if you put that seed up on that ground, they will not take root and germinate. You see the seed, the seed does not prepare the ground. The ground must be prepared for the seed, to receive the seed. See, we think that when we preach the word, that the seed, the word, will prepare the ground. You see, the, the preparation is by the Holy Spirit. He prepares the ground first, and then the seed will take root. The word of God needs the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is the instigator. He's the starter then. He's the one that quickens. He's the one that brings to life and gives the soul the ability to receive. The seed, the word. So that it says now it says with God all things are possible. See, how can you hear without somebody preaching? And how can you call on him you have who you have not believed? And how can you believe on him whom you have not heard? It's a conundrum to you, but not to God. God has a way, a strategy to work it out, the Holy Spirit and the Word. He uses these things. But remember. It, it, it has all been made possible by the sacrificial work of Christ, his meritorious work. If Christ had not been the sacrificial lamb, salvation was, could not be possible. That's right. mm. So it starts with the Father. It, as we said, that it, it, it is um, procured by the Son and is implemented by the Holy Spirit. That's right. And was with the Father, and was the cause, the meritorious cause is always the Son. And the one that will commute, commune, or commute, let me, let me say it, our efficient cause is the is is Holy Spirit. See, so see? Strategy. God work out all things. They may be believing without seeing, but not believing without hearing. You don't have to see to, to believe, but you must hear to believe. There, there must be some evidence. And the other seeing are hearing. And chances are, when it comes to the gospel, we have not seen, and yet we believe. See, the apostles, they saw, but they were going to be used by God as further evidences. See, when God revealed himself to the apostles, it was for our learning. It was for our teaching. It was for our admonition. See? Because he revealed himself to them openly, clearly. He walked with them. He talked with them openly so that they can be a witness. A witness of these things. Now, and they spoke. And they wrote. So now we believe Amen. that what David said, I believe, therefore I speak. We also believe and we also speak. See, we believe the truth and we are speaking it. We are the ones that are speaking the message of salvation. That 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 because the conundrum was is that how can you hear without a preacher? See? So we are the evidence is that God has a, a methodology or a strategy to overcome that difficulty. We are speaking what we have been told by the word of God. 
what we have heard. Remember, we started out. Who have believed our report? Who have believed the message that we are speaking? Who have believed the message that, that, that they have heard from us? Who believes that? Only the ones that have faith. You see again, now it goes back to that thing. Who have believed our report? The only way that you can believe the report is if God has given you faith. If it has been granted unto you to understand it and know it to hear. Many persons have faith in Christ without seeing him with their eyes. Many persons have faith in Jesus without seeing them with their natural eyes. Do not without hearing about him. Again, how can you have faith without hearing? That's the question. But we're going to see that that is not necessarily an absolute statement. The normal way of God transmitting truth to you is by hearing the word of God. That's the normal way. But you cannot say that God only operates that way. Remember that. You cannot put God in the box. And, and limit him to a certain action. Even though the Bible says, How can you believe on him who you have not heard? Now we're talking about initial now. We're talking about jump starting. You have a car. A car have an engine. A car have a battery. That engine is useless. That engine is useless. We took the battery. The battery is needed to start the engine. That's right. If there's no battery power, that engine will not start. Once the engine begins, once the engine is started, you don't need the battery anymore. That's right. You can take the battery out and the car will keep running. Because we have a generator that would generate the needed power to power the engine. So, so it's the same thing with the spirit. The spirit, the word, need the spirit to jump start you. To quicken you, to give you life. So that the word can now work. So that faith can now begin to take root and work. Without the Holy Spirit, faith cannot come. So the word needs the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses the word. Remember this. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a distinction here. The Holy Spirit uses the word. But he doesn't need the word. Because he's God. He's the word himself. When I say the word, I, when I'm, I'm speaking about you and me as vessels... Preaching the word then. See? We need a preacher. The Holy Spirit preaches to us, but he doesn't need a, he doesn't need us. You know, but you see, God is pleased to use us. You know, that, that, that's, one of the, that's one of the blessings that God of uh, salvation. He uses us as vessels, unclean vessels. He cleanses us. And he uses us for his own glory. The Holy Spirit can put that word in you directly without you as a preacher. He can put the word in you. He speaks, he can speak to your mind. He can speak to your intellect. In fact, he did it before the word came in written form. That's right. He had to impress it upon minds of people. See? And then they wrote it. And then they and then they communicated also maybe verbally in prophetic utterance, uh, uh, utterances. But it came from the Holy Spirit. He implanted and he impressed it upon their minds, upon their intellect, upon their wills. Hmm. And then they spoke. Holy men spoke as they were moved by God. See? By the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Amen. But what now? The normal way God has determined that men will be saved is by preaching. That's the normal way. But with God, nothing shall be impossible. Mm -hmm. See? So now that's what we got. That's the distinction now. So many persons have faith in Christ without seeing him with their eyes, do not without hearing about him. This now is to be understood from the perspective of outward hearing of the word and by adults only or, or by, by let's say mature people only. Because now we're going to see that God also works in different ways. Man, one must consider that the Holy Spirit works where and how he pleases. We cannot dictate to God how to work. We cannot tell God how to save or who to save. That's not our responsibility. All, all, all we are responsible for is to preach the cross. The message of the cross and him crucified. We pray. Of course we have we have yearnings. We have we are concerned. We have desires about our family members, our friends, about sinners in general that God will save them. That is our plea. That is our, that's what we that's what we are like I would say like propel boy. 
what motivates us that men would come to know the truth. But at the same time, recognizing that God said who he wills. He uses who he wills. He says who he wills. And we have no sin in the matter. Because it is all for his honor and his glory. We as men of God think that we have power. Oh, you know, you know I preach and you're going to be saved. I'm going to go and I'm going to preach. And I'm going to cause men to be saved. It's God that works through us. In fact, to be quite honest with you, before we even get there, the Lord has already prepared the heart to receive that word. Again, it's like, it's like preparation. The farmer first prepares the ground before he plants the seed. If the Holy Spirit doesn't draw that individual to that, to that particular camp ground or meeting or church where you're going to be speaking, how on earth you're going to, how on earth you're going to hear the, the message of the truth? Or the message of the gospel anyway. If God doesn't give them life to be there and give you life yourself. Oh, you know, you know, this, this is another thing we don't consider. That we have plans to do things. And we assume or we or we or we think that we are gonna be alive to do it, to be to have success in our, in our mission. Are we gonna be in good health? It's going to be possible. But God doesn't give of good, good health, our spirit alive. How are we going to be able to complete the mission? Oh, you know, you know. again, we assume that God sent us on a mission and it's always going to be successful. You know how many people went off on a mission from God on God's behalf and they were killed and they died before they even complete the mission? Mm. Mm. You know, like... <laughs> Oh, well, God sent me, and I must be successful. I'm going to live, and I'm going to achieve, and I'm going to do. How do you do? You know that. Moses was sent by God to Pharaoh with a message. Let my people go. Moses. God said he's going to use Moses to be the deliverer. On the way to Egypt to fulfill God's mission, <laughs> God sought to kill him. That's right. Because of That's disobedience. That's it. One of his sons wasn't circumcised. That's right. He had failed to carry out the basic command of God that all male, eight days and over, must be circumcised of Israel. Ooh. He failed to do that. And God sought to kill him until the wife. Until the wife. Until they had to perform that act of circumcision. You, you, you see, God doesn't play. God, is, God, was, God was making a statement that if I'm going to send you to a disobedient, hard hearted man like Pharaoh, you yourself mm -hmm. cannot be hard hearted and disobedient to me. That's right. See, so as ministers of the gospel, we preach and we teach, we cannot. Of ourselves be contrary and disobedient to God's word. Mm -mm, mm -mm. God will hold us responsible. Mm -mm. So God can and sometimes does work by other means, or even without any means. But his usual way and method is to bring men to faith and repentance by hearing the word of God. You know something? Let's look at Paul for a minute. Acts 9, 3 to 6. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly a light shone round about him from heaven. Then he fell on the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? So they Paul. Of course, he heard the message being preached, maybe by the apostles before, but he didn't believe it, right? Mm -hmm. But there was no direct impartation or impression of the, of the word to him by any particular person. The Lord put it in directly. Put it in directly. And the, and the amazing thing is that the, 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 the people that were with him heard a voice from heaven, but saw no man. But they did not understand what, what, what the word or uh, what the voice was saying. See, again, the word is being preached, 
Some hearts are being touched through faith, and others hear the same word and are impressed upon. They don't have a clue what you're talking about. You think every time you preach a word, I may understand what you're saying? And they reject it. And they say, oh, that's foolishness. But others are like, touch. Because it's the Holy Spirit that's imparting that word of truth to the inner man. See, not only the mind, because, you know, first and foremost, you hear things, right? Before a word can get to your heart, I mean, the normal way now, we're talking about normal way, you hear it, it goes through your mind, it goes through your brain, you process it, and then it enters the soul. And then into the spirit. But God can also directly transfuse your spirit by the word. The word can enter your spirit directly. But I mean, normal way of speaking then, normal way of transmitting information is by hearing, right? Or even when you read something, you must process it. And come to an understanding. But Paul, <laughs> he had a direct revelation from God. Also, briefly, Luke 23, 41. And, he, and we indeed justly, for we received the jury reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, And surely I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. That is one of the only things that you see that God worked on a man <laughs> when he was about to die. Nobody witnessed that guy. Nobody had and he's dealing with him. But on the cross, he was one of the elect, the children of God. The Holy Spirit had to bring to his understanding that he's a sinner. All the, all the man says, this man has done nothing wrong. He's innocent. Recognizing the sinless nature of Christ. Recognizing that he was paid for, for sin. Convicted. Convinced that he's a sinner. Convinced about the about the righteousness and purity of Christ, sinless nature. Convinced that he's the sacrifice necessary that God demands for sin. Recognize that the only the only hope for him is to call upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Mm -hmm. He might recognize all of that. You see that in that short time. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Recognize that Jesus have a kingdom, that the Father has sent him to prepare a kingdom. And he recognized that fact. He knew that fact. How did he know that in that space, that space of time? It's a direct infusion of the Holy Spirit to him. I understand him. Bring him that place of, that, of, of repentance. So you see, this God can work how he chooses. But the fact we are trying to say to you is that the main way that God works is through the preaching of the gospel. That is the main way. That is the, that is the way he has organized and set up. Therefore, it should be obvious that it is absolutely necessary that the gospel must be preached to both Jew and Gentile. Because why? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who shall, and how shall they call on, on him and whom they have not believed? And remember... The same God, his Lord to both Jew and Gentiles. Or to anyone that calls upon him from a heart of faith, sincerely. So Isaiah 55 verse 1. Ho everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine. And milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? And you register for what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ears and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. Hear the word of God and hear the gospel. Hear the good news. And your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know. And nations who do not know you shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, 
and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Now this is this is the this is cut to the matter, verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. We're going to stop there. So the point is that, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked man forsake his ways, right? Mm -hmm. And the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him come. And the Lord will abundantly pardon. See? Mm -hmm. How shall you be saved? Those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You must believe and call. And the Lord will abundantly pardon you. But you must forsake your ways, the evil ways. So scripture also affirms that it is God's will that the gospel should be preached to all people. All people, both Jew and Gentile alike. See, there's no distinction with God when it comes to the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ must be preached to all people. When they say all, it means without distinction. Between Jew, Gentile, national origin, culture, creed, race, Language. That's what it means by all people. The gospel is to be preached in all the world, then shall the income. Mm -hmm. How can you hear without a preacher? And how can you believe if the message is not preached to you? So that, that's why there's a demand then. Hearing demands a preacher. A preacher demands a message. I'm not, as then again now, Conversely speaking, a message demands a speaker. A uh, preacher, right, Pastor? If you have a message, if God gives the message and there's no one to deliver it, the message is still useless. But again, if you are a preacher and don't have a message, your preaching is, is ridiculous and contrary. See? A lot of people are preachers today. They call themselves preachers, evangelists, apostles. Prophets, but they are speaking in vain. They are speaking contrary. They are, they are speaking according to their own desires and lusts and wishes. They are not speaking the word of God. They are not speaking the message of the cross. Scripture affirms that it is God's will that the gospel is to preach to all people. Let's look at Matthew 24, 14 and Mark 16, 15. So let's leave in Matthew 24, 14. The commission, the great commission. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. Mm -hmm. And then the end will come. Right. See? The gospel of the kingdom will be preached right. in all the world yeah. as a witness yes. about the sacrificial life and death of Christ. Yeah. And then shall the end come. Right. And also on Mark 16, 15. The Great Commission. Jesus himself gave it. Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. We're going to stop there. He says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes. You see, again, what is the whole message today? How can you believe on him who you have not heard. See? He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And him that believes shall be saved. He that believes that shall be condemned. But how can you believe if you have not heard? Again, God doesn't work. By means always. He works by the gospel too. And in fact, the majority of the time God works by the gospel. Those other means are just like extraordinary. Because there's circumstances where the gospel have not reached people. I'll be talking about time pass, especially in time pass. Where 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 traveling was limited. And the method of presenting the, the word was was restricted. Today we have different mediums. Electronic, written, spoken. 
the Thai class, it wasn't that easy. And how did God save those people? Different means. Paul wasn't present when this commission was given to the apostles. You know that Paul, you see, you, you understand something. When God spoke to Paul, not only at that particular time when, when he appeared to him from heaven, because remember he told, he told Ananias, that he, he, then he says to him, and that's going to tell Paul that he's a chosen vessel to the Gentiles, and I'm going to show him things that he will suffer, that he will suffer for my name's <laughs> sake. <laughs> See, I will show him, mm. right? I will reveal to him then, I will make it known to him what he must go through for my sake. Mm. So, the Holy Spirit began to transmit things into Paul, all those doctrine truths. He, 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 in fact, he said he was trying, he was actually translated to third heavens. That's right. And he heard things that was spoken that was unlawful for him to write about. Mm. See, the Holy Spirit began to transmit and to, tra to transfer information and doctrine truth to him. See? And then he did what? He then spoke it. He then commissioned it. He then transmitted it. He then taught it. He then preached it to, to, to all the churches that were established in Asia and Europe. And then now, to us. See? So faith comes by hearing, right? Hearing by the word of God. What Paul went through, he spoke. And that's why that's why it said, we also hear and we believe. See? We are hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing what was spoken before. And now we are speaking the same thing. You see, we are speaking the same language. The gospel cannot change. You know, oh, you, you, the, the Bible needs to be uh, updated. It is too old fashioned. No, it's not. God is immutable. If God is immutable, his word cannot change. His word must fit the person himself. But he's the word. He doesn't change. The word cannot change. The same word that was spoken to Elijah mm -hmm. is the same word that he's speaking to us today. Mm -hmm. It's the same spirit. Acts 26. Oh, in fact, let's read from verse 16. This is now. This is now Paul recapping his experience on the road to the master. But rise up and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose. To make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I yet, see, yet reveal to you. I will reveal to you at a future date. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles. To whom I now send you. To open their eyes. In order to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. And an inheritance among those. Who are sanctified by faith in me. See. Thank God for Paul. Thank God for Romans. Thank God for 1 Second Corinthians. Thank God for Galatians. Thank God for Ephesians. Hallelujah. Amen. Colossians, Philippians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Philemon, Hebrews, Titus. Thank God for those books. And also 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, and Jude, and Revelation, and the, and the Gospels. Thank God for those. In fact, thank God for the whole Bible. But I'm just speaking about how God used Paul, right? I mean, we were speaking about Paul, that the things that God would reveal to him, for what purpose? To open eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, for the power sent to God, that they may receive, I, I, I'm going to put myself in this place now, that I, earnest weeks, might receive forgiveness of sins, and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in him. That's Peter, you can put your name there too. Because it's by this gospel that we are that we have been saved, that we came to another the truth. And we are now like ministers. And how shall they hear without a preacher? See? There is no hearing without preaching. That is, there is no hearing the word taught or explained without preaching or teaching. See, preaching is simply explaining the word of God. When you preach, you explain. You present, you tell, you put forth, you reveal the word of God. 
There is no hearing of Christ and salvation through him without preaching the gospel. The usual and only way of hearing from God about Christ is by the ministry of the word. That's the usual way. Listen to me. I am not here to preach about politics. I am not here to preach about finances. I am not here to preach about health. I am not here to preach about wealth. Those things will not save you spiritually. I am here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, he said there is no hearing of Christ. Now hearing and salvation through him without preaching what? Preaching the gospel. This shows not only the necessity and usefulness of the gospel ministry, but also points out the subject matter. What is the subject matter? The subject matter is Christ and him crucified. crucified. Nothing more, nothing less. Amen. So if my message of the cross is not being preached, I am not a faithful steward or a faithful minister of the gospel or a faithful minister of God. How shall they hear without a preacher? Hear what? Hear the gospel. This shows not only, not only the necessity and usefulness of the gospel ministry, but also points out the subject matter of which is Christ and Him crucified. Anyone who preaches should preach about the person of Christ. His office, this is what we're supposed to preach. This is what we're supposed to preach. This and only this. Anyone who preaches should preach about the person of Christ. His offices, grace, righteousness, his blood, sacrifice, resurrection, exaltation, intercession. Other, otherwise, person may hear the preacher and not hear about Christ. You don't need to hear hear me or hear about me. You need to hear about Christ. Mm. I cannot save you. Hearing about my life cannot save you. It's just like a, if, if, even if it's a, a, a point of information or you can say a testimony, it can't really save you. See? That's my experiences. You have to know the truth and the truth is only the truth that will set you free. The truth is the gospel. Resurrection. Exaltation, intercession, sacrifice, Christ's blood, Christ's righteousness, Christ's grace, His office. Those are what's going to save you. How shall you hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? There is no proper, rightful, regular, and lawful preaching of the word without a mission and a commission. So, no. How shall they preach unless they are sent? There is no proper, Rightful, regular, and lawful preaching of the word without a mission and commission. Acts 13, 1 to 3. Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simeon, who was also called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manion, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the, to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. They have been fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. See? That's a direct call. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure some doctrine. For according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So you see, we must preach the word, they preach some doctrine, preach the things of God, preach only the truth. And only the truth can set us free. Hallelujah. Amen. When, it, when an individual is sent by God, to preach the gospel, it also includes necessary qualifications. God, by His Spirit, bestows gifts on persons, or uh, these persons, these preachers, these ministers, enable them to preach the gospel that will bring honor and glory to His name. 
But when and only when we preach the message of the cross, that is the only way that God is glorified. Uh, honor is brought to his name. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy, destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the dispute of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know it, did not know God, it pleased God through foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For our Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greek foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is worse than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise are called in the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things which are, are things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So today, that is the message that we preach. We have been commissioned, we have been sent by God to preach, so that men will hear, and in hearing, they will believe, and in believing, they will call upon God, and in calling, they will be saved. So thank God for the word of truth. We endeavor to preach the word of God. Preach the word of God in season and out of season. With all along suffering and doctrine. Because we are here to edify. We are here to build up. We are here to strengthen. We are here to guide. We are here to reveal truth. So that your understanding will be enlightened. So may God continue to bless and keep you. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Amen.